Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. And this is Interpreting Fairy Stories by Manly P. Hall. An article taken from Horizon, the magazine of useful and intelligent living, volume seven, number three, winter, 1957. Interpreting Fairy Stories by Manly P. Hall. Most of the fairy tales, nursery rhymes, legends, myths and fables which have gladdened the hearts of young and old for countless generations have their origin in the folklore of ancient peoples. No civilized nation is without an elaborate pattern of legendary and in the course of time the stories have passed from one country to another until it is extremely difficult to trace their origin. The legend form as we know it today is associated especially with three great races of antiquity, the Chinese, the Hindu, and the Egyptian. It is safe to make the general statement that most fairy stories began in one of these three sources or were common to all of them. In all probability, the fairy story was intended for adult consumption rather than for children. The simplicity of the tales rendered them peculiarly suitable for perpetuation by the unschooled. And it is this same simplicity which has endeared them to the child mind. As a preliminary to this general survey, it will be well to classify folklore according to the principles or purposes behind the story. In this way, we gain valuable keys which may be applied to the processes of interpreting any particular legend or fable. 1. The myth. Properly defined, a myth is a story involving divine beings. It may include the accounts of the creation of the gods, the formation of the world, the creation of man by the gods, stories of divine beings, their relationships with each other, and their intervention in the lives of mortals. In most countries, mythology includes the struggle between good and evil gods for control over the world and over the lives of human beings. Most myths originate with the observation of natural phenomena by primitive peoples, unaware of the laws governing the forces of nature. One of the most celebrated and universal of all is the myth of the dying god, this includes the martyrdom of a divine being, his repose in the tomb and his resurrection after an appropriate interval. This myth belongs to the order of the agrarian fables. It is the story of the planting of the seed in the ground where it remains dead for a time and then rises in the form of the growing plant to become the savior of a hungry world. Because the growth of plants is controlled by the astronomical order of the seasons, the resurrection of the seed takes place in the spring and is celebrated in Christendom by the festival of Easter. The god Indra was the early Hindu deity of the wind, and he appears in Europe under the name Woden or Odin. Quetzalcoatl, the hero god of the Aztecs, was also a wind god. To the ancients, the wind was the symbol of breath and represented the life principle, the Holy Ghost, from Geist, a motion of Aragust. Solar and lunar myths are at the root of innumerable fables one-eyed gods are usually sun spirits and their adventures relate to the phenomenon of the seasons. Hercules and his Jewish equivalent Samson are both sun gods and the 12 labors of Hercules represent the passage of the sun through the 12 signs of the zodiac. The Egyptian Osiris is a moon god and the events of his life correspond with the 28 days of the lunar cycle. The Christian Messiah takes on the attributes of a sun god according to the accounts given in the Gospels. And in this instance, the solar myth is combined with the myth of the dying god. Two, hero myths. In this class must be included the legends of human beings who in various ways, usually magical, have come into possession of divine powers by which they are able to perform extraordinary exploits. The simple pattern of the hero myth is that the heroic person should overcome some horrible evil that threatens his nation or his time. By so doing, he is elevated to the hero's estate by the gratitude of posterity. All heroes must come to the rescue of the helpless, the afflicted, the persecuted, and those variously endangered by forces of evil, either physical, metaphysical, or demoniacal. Usually the hero actually existed in some remote time and performed actions of outstanding gallantry or ability. With the passing of time, the historical man was involved either in the symbolism of the solar myth or in the myth of the dying God or both. Sigurd, in German Siegfried, the dragon slayer and the hero of the great Icelandic epic, the Volsunga Saga, is a good example of this class of legend. 
Parsifal, the King of the Holy Grail, Prester John, the Emperor of the East, and the American Indian hero Hiawatha are examples of the hero myth. Three, the legend. This type of account is usually associated with places, relics, and the curious lore which accumulates about unusual natural formations or remarkable structures built by men in prehistoric times. The legend is a means of explaining that which is reasonably beyond explanation and frequently makes use of miracles to solve the dilemma. Old ruined castles along the Rhine, the crumbling abbeys of England, curious rock formations in Afghanistan, the Great Pyramid of Giza, and the Wall of China are all fit subjects for legendary. As it is the purpose of the legend to explain, it makes use of elements derived from customs, traditions, and local beliefs. There is also a class of legend which deals with persons whose actions defy explanation. Therefore, legends spring up about heroes such as Charlemagne, Barbarossa, Genghis Khan, and Joan of Arc. The Allegory. To this order of accounts belong such stories as personalize impersonal qualities and attributes, or reduce universal truths to a comprehensible state by means of fiction. Most religious rituals are allegorical because they represent divine processes at work in human life. The mystery dramas of the ancient Greeks in which the heavenly order of gods was represented by masked actors who played out the great dramas of the cosmos are properly termed sublime allegories. Five, the fable. In this class belong stories about simple conduct that teach a lesson. One of the largest classes of fables is that in which animals are endowed with human attributes, usually to ridicule human actions. The Hindus seem to have originated this mode of instruction, and its great exponent among the Greeks was the hunchback slave Aesop. By means of the fable, common errors of human nature are exposed in an amusing form, which reveal the stupidity of these actions. For this reason, the fable is especially useful in the instruction of the young, because it belongs to an order of character-building traditions. By the use of familiar simile, the fable becomes generally understandable and is remembered throughout life. 6. The Parable This is a construction which points out a course of conduct under a particular circumstance by reference to some natural phenomena, or a parallel course of conduct under another circumstance. The parable, like the fable, is rooted in generally accepted opinion about right and wrong. The most celebrated of all parables are those used by Jesus in the instruction of his disciples and followers. The parable of the mustard seed and that of the talents are familiar to all and reveal in words of one syllable the proper course of human action under certain conditions. 7. The Miracle Play It was customary during the medieval period of the Christian Church to portray incidents normal from the life of Christ, the Apostles and the Saints in the form of religious dramas given on the broad, flat space in front of the cathedrals and churches. These miracle plays combined fable, parable, and moralism, and served as a method for instructing the illiterate in the principles of Christian morality. To this group also belongs the morality play, the only drama permitted by the early church. In Oriental countries, miracle plays and morality plays are sometimes presented with small puppets or dolls instead of living persons. This also occurred in Europe, and the modern Punch and Judy show is a survival of a religious drama in which Punch was Pontius Pilate and Judy was Judas Iscariot. 8. The Fairy Story Proper This must deal with one of the orders of mysterious sprites or elemental spirits such as gnomes or dwarfs, nymphs or undines, salamanders or fire spirits, and sylphs or air spirits, the familiar winged fairy with her magic wand is a sylph or air spirit from the Persian name for these little creatures, Peri. The fairy story has gradually increased in scope until it includes elements of legendary, hero myth, allegory and morality play. The proper fairy story must have a happy ending. The fairy prince saves the fairy princess and they live happily together forever, contrary to all reasonable expectancy. One of the most familiar of all fairy stories is Cinderella. In various forms, this story recurs in the literature of China, India, Egypt, Greece, Scandinavia, Russia, the Balkans, and even among the American Indians. Fairy stories have been defined as man's natural imagining toward the beautiful and the expression of his inner conviction of the ultimate victory of right over wrong. It is therefore definitely related to the hero myth in which the virtuous person triumphs over adversity. The books of Horatio Alger, so popular with the young people of the last generation, were fairy stories built upon the theme that virtue triumphs. 9. The Political Fable 
A number of familiar fairy stories and nursery rhymes originated as political satire, thinly veiled denunciations of the corruption which existed in the church and state. Mother Hubbard and her empty cupboard seems to have begun as a denunciation of the extravagances of Queen Elizabeth, who kept her cupboard, the national treasury, forever empty. The Mother Goose rhyme about Mistress Mary, quite contrary, was dedicated to the peculiarities of Mary, Queen of Scots, whose contrary notions were the scandal of her time. The Shakespearean plays abound in the element of optical fable, and the Midsummer Night's Dream was a direct attack upon King James I, who is represented with the head of a donkey bellowing for his Scotch porridge. 10. Curse Legends a considerable order of fables has sprung up about the belief that ill luck follows those who do wrong until they have repented of their sins. The idea began from a practical observation of the consequences of wrongdoing, and the offences regarded as most reprehensible at the time the fable was devised received the greatest weight of odium. The most famous of the curse fables are the stories, The Wandering Jew and the Flying Dutchman. 11. The Philosophical Fable Certain esoteric doctrines preserved in secret by orders of initiated persons have been represented and perpetuated under fables, legends, allegories, symbols, emblems, figures, and various other devices. These devices are meaningless to the profane, but convey a profound meaning to those who are a party to the secret. Under such a heading should be included the curious symbol of the alchemists, astrologers, and Kabbalists, the myths of the Rosicrucians and Illuminati, and the legends of early Freemasonry. The quest after universal wisdom became the search for the philosopher's stone, the universal medicine, the pearl of great price, or the holy grail. An interesting example of philosophical symbolism is the ordinary deck of playing cards which had its origin among the Egyptians. Another is the die used in gambling, and a third is the chessboard. In studying the modern fairy story, it is necessary to realize that any or all of the various elements described above may be present in a single story. The story itself may be ancient, or it may be a modern devisement built upon ancient or traditional patterns. It is well, if possible, to determine the antiquity of the particular tale under consideration. Good places to look for the originals of modern stories are the animal fables of India, Aesop's fables, the Red Chamber stories of China, the Arabian Nights, and the writings of Homer. If it is impossible to trace the story to these sources, and no outside source of information is available, then the tale must be examined to discover the general design of the inner content. A little thought will reveal the framework, and we can decide whether we are dealing with a hero myth, a morality legend, a fable, or a parable. Context is also important. If the legend occurs among the writings of alchemists or mystics, it may reasonably be suspected that the interpretation is according to the doctrines of these groups. A broad knowledge of comparative religion, the arts and sciences, sociology, ethics and politics, is useful in classifying legends of all kinds. For example, consider the story of Tannhauser and his visit to the Venusberg. The story belongs to the order of curse legends. Tannhauser commits a sin against his faith, for which he must repent in order to gain ultimate forgiveness. The Venusberg belongs to the pre-Christian law of Central Europe and of course represents heathenism and degeneracy. Elizabeth signifies Tannhauser's own spiritual soul and redemption through pure love. As Tannhauser visits the Venusberg under the earth, we have traces of the agricultural myth of the seed that dies and rises again. This is further pointed up by the blossoming of the pilgrim staff as a sign of forgiveness. The blossoming staff is derived from apocryphal legends of the New Testament, where it is said that Joseph was selected to be the husband of Mary because his rod budded on the altar of the temple. In Tannhauser, there are evidences of the hero myth also, for he accomplishes his own regeneration and becomes a hero. In substance, the Tannhauser theme is that of the fall of man into sin and his redemption through grace, and can be traced back in broad outline to the parable of the prodigal son. There is a psychological phase which must be taken into consideration in all legendary. Human beings develop two kinds of mechanisms in thinking. The first is defense mechanism and the second is escape mechanism. Defense mechanism is dedicated to the justification of present conduct. The mind creates innumerable devices to protect the personality from pain, humiliation and unpleasant comparison. 
This mechanism usually falls back upon tradition to justify familiar ways of action and builds defenses against the discomforts of innovation or change. Many legends and fables are intended to glorify race, nation and community. These defense mechanisms are most marked among peoples dominated by an inferiority complex. The escape mechanism is a release of the normal human impulse to be happy. If happiness is not to be attained under existing conditions, then at some future time or under some different conditions or in some far place, the dream of happiness will be fulfilled. If necessary, the supernatural is invoked to bring about the desired state when this is contrary to natural expectations. The concept of heaven is the ultimate religious form of the escape mechanism. In this same class belongs the story Lost Horizon with its fabled city of Shangri-La. Human beings desire physical immortality and many stories of escape mechanism involve the long livers, mortal creatures who discovered in some way the fountain of youth. Most mortals desire to be rich and escape from present poverty. For such as these, the treasures of the Arabian Nights and such stories as the Count of Monte Cristo possess an eternal fascination. Thus, natural human instincts play their part in framing legend and fable. There is no truer way of discovering the soul of a people than through the study of its folklore. Here are revealed the secret impulses which men would fear to express openly, but which they treasure in the depths of their natures. The method by which history is gradually transformed into legend reveals another process eternally at work in the human mind. Most legends originated in times when history was perpetuated by oral tradition. When a man tells a story, he nearly always adds elements of personal interpretation to the original account. It is a constant and consistent ambition to convert others to our ways of thinking. To accomplish this, we color narratives with conclusions of our own without revealing our additions to the stories. In this way, we believe that we can bestow the dignity of tradition upon our personal opinion and pass our exaggerations as part of the original account. Thus, stories accumulate new elements, with each generation taking on the color of locality and revealing the secret convictions of each storyteller who passes them along. For example, Goethe's story of Faust is built up from diverse elements gathered from a wide variety of sources. In its final form, Faust is philosophical fiction, again a variation on the prodigal son theme with the escape mechanism of final salvation. Yet the original Dr. Faust was a real person who dabbled in sorcery, gained the local reputation of being a necromancer and was finally discovered with a knife in his back on the floor of his laboratory, the victim of an unknown assassin. Because the town folk were convinced that he was in league with the devil, it was the solemn self-justifying conviction of these honorable burghers that the devil himself had murdered the old alchemist in order to gain control of his immortal soul. Robbery was a much more likely explanation but this did not fit in so well with the pattern of the local gossip, so the reasonable was ignored in favor of the impossible. Then another element was incorporated into the fabric of this rapidly developed legend. A man by the name of Fust worked with Gutenberg in the invention of the printing press. These two men were able to produce what appeared to be handwritten books far more rapidly than God had intended. There could be but one explanation. These printers were in league with the devil and rubricated their books with human blood. Old engravings show the prince of evil turning the crank on the old printing press. It is in this way that Satan himself became the printer's devil. The name Fust sounded quite a bit like Faust, and the two men were merged into a common fiction. Other legends were added from the lives of several alchemists, cabalists, and magicians, until finally the perfect sorcerer came into existence and his story became the substance of the public conviction of the time relating to matters of demonism. Another fairy tale with a similar background is the story of Bluebeard and his secret closet filled with the bodies of his murdered wives. The original Bluebeard was Gilles de Rey, who was burned at the stake for the unpleasant practice of offering human sacrifices on the altar of Satan. He was a nobleman who lived in a gloomy old castle. When numerous women and children disappeared from the neighboring villages, an investigation was made and their bodies were found in the cellars of his castle. He was properly tried by the Holy Inquisition, found guilty on innumerable counts, admitted his guilt and was duly executed. He is usually pictured with a long black beard and it is by this beard that he is especially remembered in story and legend. 
In several languages, the word for fairy is associated with the word for fate. For example, the Italian fata and the Latin fatare from fatum, meaning fate or destiny. From this, we may infer that fairies were regarded as mischievous creatures associated with curious tricks of fate and miraculous happenings in general. For the most part, fairies were regarded as benevolent and they came to the assistance of mortals in distress, righting wrongs and protecting worthy persons from the evil deeds of others. In many fairy tales, these good spirits preserve their human friends from the plots of evil beings, witches, sorcerers, giants and ogres. Modern writers of children's stories usually follow traditional patterns, thus perpetuating the ancient belief that good and evil spirits variously affect mortals with their supernatural powers. The most celebrated of all books about fairy creatures is the Comte de Gabelet by the Abbe Nain de Montfaucon de Villars. This book, which was published in the 17th century, was called A Rosicrucian Fable, and most modern authors have derived inspiration from its contents. The learned abbe went into great detail about the life and habits of fairy creatures and was rewarded for his industry by being assassinated. Villars derived much of his inspiration from the work of Paracelsus on submundanes. Alexander Pope's beautiful poem, The Epar of the Lock, is based on the writings of Villars. One of the most famous of modern stories about the fairies Undine is a direct development of this early source of material. The universal distribution of the belief in fairies can be satisfactorily explained in terms of the psychic sensitivity of primitive people. All antiquity united in accepting the reality of elemental creatures. Paracelsus went so far as to classify the traditions in the form of a general text in which the reality of the submundanes is assumed and their lives, habits and temperaments described in considerable detail. Paracelsus declared that the four elements, earth, water, fire and air, are inhabited with beings composed entirely of the substances of these elements and the ethers which sustain and nourish the elements. The element of water is the world of the nymphs, undines and sea sprites. The element of fire is the abode of the salamanders who are divided into several orders of igneous creatures. The element of air is the sphere of the sylphs, fairies, fays and storm elementals and the element of the world is inhabited by gnomes and dwarves. The creatures of the elements are composed entirely of one substance, have no immortal souls but live to great age because there is no friction in their organisms. They are divided into families, tribes, races and nations, are ruled over by kings and princes of their own kind and have their homes and places of abode. Their clothing is part of their bodies, they are not subject to disease, but they do engage in wars. The elementals sometimes concern themselves in the affairs of men. The gnomes become the faithful servants of magicians, but are jealous and revengeful. The undines become strongly attached to humans, as do also the sylphs, but these last are extremely mischievous. The salamanders seldom approach human beings because their fiery element is destructive to human life. There are many legends that celebrated magicians and philosophers were the product of the union of an elemental and a human being. Merlin, the magician at the court of King Arthur, is believed to have been the product of such a union. There is an account that the father of Pythagoras was a sylph, and there is a story in the Near East that Zoroaster was the son of the king of the salamanders and a mortal woman. Among many nations, it was believed that the earth was inhabited by elementals prior to the creation of man. The Irish, for example, have their stories of the little people who were driven into the fens and marshes by the human progenitors of the present Irish race. In Norse mythology, we find the stories of the Nibelung, an order of dwarves belonging to the class of gnomes who mined the treasures of the earth. The seven little miners in the fairy story of Snow White are Nibelungs, the keepers of the hidden treasures of the earth. It has been suggested that the belief in fairies may have its physical origin in legends about primitive races of pygmies, but classical antiquity was too learned in general to support such a belief. It is wiser to assume either a psychical or a psychological background for the tradition. It was common to believe that elemental beings were part of nature's economy, 
for they were the keepers and preservers of the lower forms of life in the mineral, plant and animal kingdoms. The fairy story formula recurs with such consistency among widely scattered nations that it is evident that all the stories are aspects of a single basic conviction universally distributed. Take, for example, the story of Santa Claus. The name Santa Claus is said to be a corruption of St. Nicholas. It is therefore interesting to note that the legend flourished among non-Christian people and was well established in pre-Christian time. St. Nicholas was a sort of theological Robin Hood. Moved by his saintly conviction, this good man pilfered from the rich and secretly redistributed the goods among the poor. His mystical kleptomania was accepted and respected even by those whose possessions he spirited away. When St. Nicholas left the house, a quick inventory might reveal that a gilt cup or silver candlestick left with him. Said cup or candlestick might reappear in the hovel of some poor farmer or destitute widow. This mystery was regarded as an act of providence, assisted by the ingenuity of the good saint. Hence he became the symbol of secret giving, and when the child found a new doll on Christmas morning, the parents solemnly announced that St. Nicholas had brought it. Time and the charm of the fable resulted in the present universal belief. But all this happened long before kindly St. Nicholas secreted the family silver in his broad sleeves. Little Egyptian children found toys hidden about their homes on the day of the birth of the sun god. They were told that a mysterious little old man, no taller than a child's knee and adorned with a long beard, brought them the toys from his mysterious workshop at the North Pole. When the Egyptian god Bees was turned out of his house in the far north by Christian theologians, Saint Nicholas moved in and took over the chores. The Greeks also have their god of secret giving, as do the Chinese, and while the details differ, the principle is always the same. The Indians of Southwest America make little dolls which they give to their children secretively. These little dolls are said to have been made and brought to the children by gods living in the old mountains whose white crests line the distant sky. When Loki, the fire god of the Scandinavians, married, he became the father of a strange brood. Among his children were Midgard, a great serpent whose body lay beneath the ocean and encircled the whole earth, and Fenris the wolf, a horrible creature of monstrous size who ravaged the world, and crouching in the far north with flaming red eyes and drooling jowls, waited to devour both gods and men. Fenris, is the big bad wolf of modern fairy tales. It is he who ate poor old grandma and then hid in her bed waiting for little Red Riding Hood to appear. After Loki, whose flaming body gave rise to Mephisto's scarlet coat, had betrayed the gods and brought about the death of Balder the Beautiful, he was punished by being chained beneath the earth. Above him was placed a poisonous serpent whose venom dropped incessantly upon the body of Loki. These drops of venom caused indescribable suffering and the chained god twisted and writhed with pain. It is thus that the old Norse people explained the earthquake and the avalanche. It was their belief that drops of water, the venom of the snake, seeped through the earth and came in contact with the subterranean fires causing combustion in the underworld. This combustion produced seismic disturbances. Some fairy stories originate in an observation of natural phenomena. It was once regarded as only a myth that in the home of the gods in the far north, day and night were six months each. Now we know that in a sense, the phenomenon of the midnight sun explains the legend. Fairy stories belonging to the class of Jack the Giant Killer go back to such legends as Apollo slaying the snake Python, the labors of Hercules, and the Egyptian story of the young Horus slaying the giant Typhon. In the Scandinavian legends, Siegfried, the dragon slayer, is merely a restatement of the Babylonian account of Bel, the slayer of the dragon of chaos. The dragon represents cosmic energy and it is still used in this way in the symbolism of the Chinese. All giants are forms of the Titans. The Greek giants who represented in their warfare the struggle of energies in space prior to the creation of the cosmos. Jack the giant killer is one of the aspects of the eternal legend of man conquering nature. To accomplish this conquest, he must have recourse to certain magical aids. Often this aid takes the form of a magic sword, like the Excalibur of King Arthur and the Singing Blade of Siegfried. The sword always represents the human will by which the forces of nature can be controlled. The Nordic Thor, 
the equivalent of Hercules, fought the giants of darkness with a magic hammer of red-hot iron. In order to use this hammer, Thor had to wear a fire-resisting glove. This hammer is the thunderbolt of Zeus, with one curious difference. Thor's hammer was so shaped that when he threw it, it always returned to him. The shape of the hammer was the swastika, a universal symbol of will overcoming chaos. The hammer has come into ill repute as a symbol of the Aizan party, but strangely enough, the Germans have reversed the direction of the angle on the arms of the central cross, so that the whirling cross, as it is called, turns in the opposite direction from that of the ancient symbolism. The typical fairy story usually includes a romantic pattern. Nearly always the hero performs his brave actions for the sake of the fair princess of his heart. Sometimes he is the poor boy who makes good. Sometimes he is a prince in his own right. But always he is rescuing a fair damsel in distress. The romantic story as we know it is as ancient and basic as human emotions. But it was adapted to the fairy story form largely by the bards and troubadours. These were the wandering minstrels and storytellers who entertained in the homes of the rich and the great. Nearly always they sang of the beautiful maiden held prisoner in the castle of some fearful, giant, wicked king or horrible sorcerer. Always this fair maiden was the personification of all virtues and excellence, and she was rescued by the young hero who passed through all kinds of dangers for her sake. This is the story of knight errantry and the codes of the age of chivalry. Now the bards and the troubadours were a guild, bound together by vows into a secret platonic fraternity. The woman of whom they sang was not a mortal person at all, but the Virgin Sophia, the Gnostic symbol of spiritual truth. It was truth, therefore, truth supremely beautiful and supremely good that was held prisoner by evil men. It was the truth seeker who dared all in life, who went in quest of universal wisdom. It was the same truth for which the heroic soul fought against the enchantments of the mortal world by slaying evil overcoming the wicked plots inspired by selfishness and ambition, the truth is finally liberated to become the bride of the one who has earned it. Once this is accomplished, the prince and the princess, man and truth, live happily forever after. In sober fact, truth is the only thing which can abide with man forever. In the forms of the legend, we have Siegfried rescuing the sleeping Brunhilde from the circle of flame, Perseus saving Andromeda from the dragon of the deep, and the young prince forcing his way through the forest of brambles to waken sleeping beauty. Frequently, the princess sleeps until her prince charming wakens her. This means that truth remains unknown, unknowable and inactive until man wakens it with his mind and will. An advanced form of this mythology is concealed in the story of Parsifal. In this legend, as adapted by Wagner for his opera, Parsifal himself is a form of man who became Christ by spiritual attainment. Kundri, the snake maiden, appears in the role of Mary of Magdala, who dried the feet of the Savior with her hair. The symbolism is daring in the extreme, for the name Kundri is obviously derived from Kundalini, the serpent power in the human spine. Among the Greeks and Latins, Mercury was the god of thieves, especially those who were waiting to be hung for their crimes. In the northern myths, Odin, who was a form of Mercury, hangs himself to the world tree, thus becoming a type of the convicted criminal. Christ, crucified between two thieves and suffering the penalty reserved for common criminals, belongs to the same class of symbolism. It must be remembered that under Roman law, religious or political criminals were not crucified. Mercury appears again in the form of Robin Hood, and Odin reappears in Germany in the story of the Pied Piper of Hamelin. There is something of the survival of tradition in every action that we perform, and in all the customs which have become familiar to us through folklore. Picking up pins for good luck is a survival of the time when pins were rare and expensive and were sold to the public only once a year. Pin money was money saved for the purpose of buying pins, and the good luck due to the direction in which the pin lay at the time it was found is associated with early experiments with the compass point. The ill luck of 13 at the table originated with the Last Supper of Christ and his disciples. And Friday the 13th is supposed to be a compound evil because it combines the day of the week on which Christ was crucified with the ill-fated 13 at supper. It was John Baptiste Portia who first emphasized the similarity in appearance between human beings and certain animals. 
He wrote a learned book on this subject in which he points out that these similarities are nearly always accompanied by similarities of temperament and disposition. Portia did not originate the belief that animal appearance was especially related to animal qualities. The Greeks and Romans made use of these elements in numerous fables. Pythagoras taught that human beings coming into birth descended through the spheres of the zodiacal constellations and took on the appearances of the heavenly animals. This explains the Pythagorean doctrine that men were reborn as animals, a doctrine generally misunderstood by modern writers. The outstanding work of animal fables is the collection attributed to Aesop. Later came the adventures of Reynard the Fox, whose exploits have fascinated countless generations of children and adults. The brothers Grimm collected their stories from the folklore of the German peasants. Therefore, most of Grimm's fairy tales belong to an early period. We shall select one belonging to the class of morality stories as an example for interpretation. The tale is called The Shroud. It is the story of a little boy seven years old who was so handsome and lovable that everyone adored him. His mother was therefore grief-stricken when he suddenly became ill and died. After his death, she could not be comforted and wept day and night for her lost child. Soon after the child was buried, he appeared by night in the places where he played during life. If the mother wept, the little spirit wept also. The mother's grief increased, and at last one night, the little boy came to her, dressed in his white shroud and with the wreath of funeral flowers about his head, and he spoke thus, Oh, mother, do stop crying, or I shall never fall asleep in my coffin, for my shroud will not dry because of all thy tears which fall upon it. The mother was so frightened that she wept no more. The next night, the boy came again, holding a little light in his hand, saying, Look, mother, my shroud is nearly dry and I can rest in my grave. When the mother heard this, she gave her sorrow into God's keeping, and the child returned no more. This is a folk tale based on the esoteric tradition of earthbound souls. The excessive grief for those who have departed prevents them from going on to the life beyond. The little boy could not escape from the vibrations of his mother's sorrow, so he returned to her and taught her the wise course to follow. The story has application to the lives of many modern people. We still try to hold our loved ones to us after the laws of nature have decreed that they depart. It is not wise or good to grieve for the dead. Rather, we should release them and send them forth on their great adventure with loving thoughts for their good and not selfish impulses of our own. Stories like Hansel and Gretel, the babes in the woods, belong to the class of humanity tales based on the struggle of the human being to conquer the mysteries of his earth life. Hansel and Gretel are man and woman. The dark forest is the physical world. And the wicked witch in the sugarcake house is the force of spiritual destruction, hiding behind the illusions of the senses and the gratifications of the appetites. The witch fattens the children, that is, gives human beings false success in order to devour them. In Egypt, Typhon, the god of death, devours human beings who have departed from the spiritual way of life. Hansel and Gretel are sent into the forest three times to represent the three races through which human beings have been born into the material world. The real meanings of fairy stories must be discovered by the unfolding consciousness of the reader, for they are mediums for the release of his own misunderstanding. The more he knows of philosophy and mysticism, the richer the stories become, until in the end he discovers in each of them some great truth about himself and his world. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.